No, you're, you're good. Sounds perfect. All right, well, let me share the screen. And first of all, I just want to thank you guys for, for being here. Um, I know it's after hours and you guys could be uh, playing esports or just hanging out with friends or, or what have you, but I'm Robert Zulo, uh, Dr. Zulo, or just plain old Zulo, as a lot of students call me. And I'm an associate professor of business and sports management at Westminster College. And um, some folks asked me to come in and talk about how do you work in sports? How do you get a job in sports? And my background and my passion, passion really tends to be more in intercollegiate athletics. So if you ever go on the Barnes Noble website or Amazon or Walmart, there's actually a, a textbook that I wrote with a colleague from North Carolina about um, the administration of intercollegiate athletics. And so it really looks at some of the day-to-day -day operations in college sports and fundraising and marketing and the rules and regulations, which is called compliance, event management, ticketing, um, a wide range of those areas. But I thought I would take you guys back a little bit further um, to when I was younger. And so I grew up in Virginia. And so one of the first experiences I had with sports was being an, a captain of an 0-22 basketball team. And, and yeah, that's, that's actually right. It, it was 0-22. But in, in my defense, we, we played against this guy right here. And you may not recognize him wearing his Bethel High School jersey, but that's Alan Iverson. And so there was actually a game one time where Alan Iverson and I combined for about 56 points. Um, he had 51 of those points and I had the other five and that was at halftime, but that kind of made me realize, okay, he's going to the pros in one direction and, and I need to find another way to get there because his path is gonna be definitely different than mine. So I, I decided to go to college and I was very fortunate to go to the University of Virginia and while I was there, they didn't have a sports management program. They, they um, had a wide range of majors and, and I started volunteering in the athletic department. So I worked with the, um, uh, the men's soccer team and they had a couple of national championships that they won. So that was exciting, even though I couldn't play a lick of soccer. And I, I helped out with the women's basketball team. And I really liked that because here I, I was able to be a practice player and be out there with these six foot six women so I, I still remember the first time that I, I practiced with the six foot six women and they said, stop this, this, the way you're trying to finesse everything, play like a man and be tough, get us ready for Tennessee. And then she swamply or promptly blocked my shot into the stands during practice. So after that, it was on. And after that, it was no more um, uh, being polite to women. It was, all right, I got to get her ready to, to beat Tennessee and, and to get to the final four, the elite eight and stuff. So it was really a great experience to open my eyes to the amazing athletic ability of women and the importance of gender equity. So I graduated from there and spent one year as an intern down the road at a school called the Virginia Military Institute. And that was division one. Uh, division one at the FCS level. So that's kind of like Duquesne and Robert Morris and YSU. Um, so they have fewer scholarships. And it was, it was really a fascinating time to be there because it was an all male school. And they were integrating that year for the very first time. So a lot of the alums did not like the idea of the school integrating. And the media was really um, flocking to the school to see if there was going to be any chaos and um, the women that were there, the, the first class of women that were there, um, you know, they were kind of nervous, all this media attention, but they did exceptionally well and just continued to flourish and advanced on and graduated. And for me, I was able to get the experience in ticketing and get the experience in marketing and game management. Um, that year, actually, I still remember we sold out the arena when we played Penn State and we beat Penn State in this very small venue and everybody stormed the court. And it was at that moment that I realized, okay, this is what I wanna do. I wanna work in sports. I wanna be around it. So I decided from there, um, I need to go to grad school. And being a, a UVA grad, I thought there's no way I'm going to Chapel Hill. There's no way I wanna to go to North Carolina. We don't like North Carolina, but one of the associate athletic directors at VMI said, listen, North Carolina has this program that's very small, and it really focuses just on intercollegiate athletics. And I think you'd like it. So I looked into it and I applied and I had to go up there for an interview and the rest is history. And it was all, all expenses paid too, because I, I taught PE courses. I still remember teaching racquetball, teaching um, uh, soccer, um, teaching tennis. 
and that paid for the education, teaching some of those PE classes. So that was a great experience. Unfortunately, I have the picture of Vince Carter. I, I miss Vince Carter by one year. You know, being an undergrad at Virginia, uh, Vince Carter always dunked on everybody. And anytime that he and Anton Jamison came into the gym, it was just like they were the basketball gods. So here I am excited to go to North Carolina and he decided to go pro. Uh, so I got dunked on by Iverson, but I never got to see Vince Carter dunk in person other than when I was at UVA. So then I decided it was time for me to go pro. And so before I finished my second year at UNC, there was an opportunity to go join the sports marketing staff at Virginia Tech. And that was at, that was at a time when Michael Vick was there. They were coming off of their national championship game run. And so I, I decided to move up to Blacksburg, Virginia and work in their sports marketing department. And that was just like sacrilegious. You know, if you went to Virginia for undergrad, it was one, one thing to go to North Carolina, that's, that's bad. But to go to the arch rival, Virginia Tech, people just stopped talking to me, but that was fine. That was fine because I was able to really focus on uh, trying to fill the seats for sports like basketball and women's basketball and, and wrestling and baseball and softball. We didn't have to worry about filling the seats for football. Michael Vick took care of that. Um, but the other sports, it really gave us a chance to try to find sponsors for some of the other sports and to really uh, learn more and, and be involved in a, a big time atmosphere. VMI was a, a great start, but to really get, get immersed into Virginia Tech, that was something special. And it was really interesting at that time because Virginia Tech started playing Thursday night football games on ESPN. And usually your Thursday nights were reserved for smaller schools. But Virginia Tech saw that there was something to be had by playing on Thursday night and having all of this national exposure. So that brought a lot of attention to Michael Vick, it brought a lot of attention to the school of Virginia Tech, and, and it, it really gave them a spotlight that if they only played on Saturdays, they might have had to share that spotlight. So it was, it was a neat time to be there to see some of this innovation in sports. But even being at Virginia Tech, there, there was just a part of me that kept hearing about the Southeastern Conference and, and how big sports was in the South. So I decided I, I wanted to get my PhD and I knew I wanted to go someplace warm to get my PhD. So I headed down South to the University of Georgia and that was different. Virginia Tech was big, but Georgia, they start tailgating on Thursday and they leave on Sunday. Um, they all dress up in red. They all like to bark because they are the Bulldogs. You'll get 10,000 people at a gymnastics meet. You'll, you'll pack the arena for a swimming match or a swimming meet or a, a tennis match because they've won national championships on those sports. Uh, base, baseball, they play year round. So those, the, the diamond was always packed there. So it was bigger. It was interesting to see how the depths of the fan extended to other sports and, and to be there and, and to work in athletics for three years while doing the PhD it was something special, but it was there that they asked me to maybe teach a class here in sports business because um, they were short faculty. So I jumped in and said, sure, I'll teach. And, and that kind of get, that kind of bit me, that, that bug bit me. And so I decided to um, make the transition from working in sports to teaching sports. And so I moved to a couple of states over to Mississippi State. And Mississippi State is known for their cowbells. If you ever go down there, they're known for baseball and they're known for their cowbells. So um, fans will always ring the cowbells. And it, it, the cowbells never really bothered anybody when they were losing in football. But once they started getting people like Dak Prescott and winning some games, and all of a sudden everybody started complaining about the noisemakers and, and the rules that you weren't allowed to have noisemakers. So it's always exciting to see uh, a school that um, was kind of the bottom dweller in the SEC for so long and football really started to do some great things. And it was great teaching there because that's where I cut my teeth. But I still had my parents asking me when I was going to grow up and get a real job. You know, they, they couldn't understand that sports was actually a job, that working in sports was actually a job and that teaching sports was actually a job. So I thought if I moved closer to home and taught at James Madison, they, they, they might understand that a little bit more. So I, I came back to the state of Virginia and taught at James Madison for two years and, and really enjoyed my experience there. But as, as a lot of times people know, you know, sometimes you meet somebody and they, they uh, sweep you off your feet. So I, I did happen to meet somebody and, and so she swept me off my feet and I decided to move up to Pennsylvania and the Pittsburgh area to teach at a school known as Seton Hill. 
Now, it turned out that the girl that swept me off my feet was not the one that I ended up marrying, but there was a girl that I met at Seton Hill, and she was the one that I ended up marrying. And so she's outside right now playing with our four-year-old, and it's just a, the love of my life. So sometimes you, you don't know when things are going to present themselves. So that um, Seton Hill and love the experience there. And then my wife had the opportunity to come down to this side of Pittsburgh and become a vice president at uh, Teal College. So she and I enjoy a very healthy rivalry. Um, she's at Teal College, and I'm at Westminster College. So I always tell my student athletes, you know, whatever you do, um, you can lose to W and J, you can lose to Bethany, you can lose to uh, Case Western, but you have to beat, you always have to beat Teal College. And so far, we've done pretty well in that. So my talk tonight was a little bit about how do you get into the sports field and, and what exactly do you need to know about working in sports? And I wanted to start off with 1966. And that sounds like a kind of random year because many of you guys may not have been born in 1966. When you look back on that year, it's Lyndon Johnson was president of Star Trek and, and um, William Shatner, a younger William Shatner was on TV with Leonard Nimoy. And some of the big songs of 1966 were I'm a Believer, Somewhere in the City, a uh, wild thing, not, not the current version, but the older version. But why 1966? What's so special about 1966? And the answer is, in 1966, the very first sports management program was started. 1966. Now, some of you may not be sports historians, but I'm sure you know that the Pirates, the Steelers, the Penguins, a lot of professional sports, the Olympics, they've been going on for a lot longer than 1966. So a lot of times students would come out of business programs and communications programs and other majors and start working in the sports industry. But in 1966, Ohio U said, well, well, let's take something and let's make it business and communications and add sports into it. And we'll have the very first sports management program. Now, to this day, they are referred to as the Harvard of sports management. Their alumni Rolodex is through the roof. And they really set the, 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 the model for everybody else to emulate. And when you're talking about benchmarking, they're a program that we all look to to say, okay, what are they doing cutting edge? And how can we borrow some of that for our school? So our friends down the road in Athens, Ohio, they're the ones that got it started in 1966. But even when we first started sports management programs, there was a continuous struggle. There was a continuous struggle. And what this struggle was about was what exactly is sports management? And some people thought it was physical education. And some people really looked at it and said, well, no, it's more about the history and the humanities of sports, looking at sociology, looking at psychology, looking at gender issues. Some people really looked at it and said, no, no, sports management, that's coaching. That's, that's coaching is sports management. But then some people looked at it and said, no, it, it's a business. It, it's a business. Well, that's the continuous struggle that we have today. If, if you were to go to different programs across the United States, some of them are in some areas, some are in other areas. So this struggle continues to live on today. But fortunately, we were able to get the educators together and we were really able to form a core. Now, this is a picture from a long time ago, back in the 80s, when the Boston Celtics had a core of Dennis Johnson, Danny Ainge, Robert Parrish in the middle, Kevin McHale, and some guy named Larry Bird. Larry Bird's in the Hall of Fame and arguably one of the greatest 20 players to ever play. And the Celtics had a core that stayed together for many years to win numerous championships. Well, the educators in sports management finally came together and they decided we need to make our core. And our core is gonna focus on these courses right here. We're gonna look at and prepare students in the area of ethics. We're going to help students to embrace finance and economics. We're gonna help students to better grasp legal issues as they relate to sports. We're gonna talk about management of sports and planning and organizing and leading and evaluating. We're also gonna bring in sports marketing and sports media, but we're also gonna to continue to discuss sociology and, and psychology as well in some of those humanity uh, courses. What's interesting is in putting together this core, one of the things that nobody really thought about was facility and events. So even though the core has been established, it continues to evolve on a regular basis as, as faculty continue to look at it, educators continue to look at it and say, how do we need to tweak it 
to continue to move forward. By the way, the, uh, the GIF that's on, on the screen in front of you, <clears throat> that was the Boston Celtics playing the Atlanta Hawks. And that was the first basketball game, first NBA game I was ever able to see. And <clears throat> it was when I was a young boy living in Louisiana with my parents. And my dad was going to take me to this game. It was a neutral site game in New Orleans at the University of New Orleans Lakefront Arena. So that's why it says New Orleans on the court. The, the, the Hawks had Dominique Wilkins and the Celtics were my team and they had Larry Bird. My dad couldn't go at the last second. So my mom took me. <clears throat> and on that night, Larry Bird scored 60 points. It was one of the best things I've ever seen, but it's also one of the worst things that ever happened to me in the sports arena. Because from this day forward, if somebody doesn't score 60 points in a basketball game, I go home disappointed. And I still remember my mom and I coming home about midnight, walking in the door, and my dad was like, how was it? It was, it was great. And, I, and so I'm, I'm like so excited, and, and it was really awesome, and the, and the crowd was great, and, and the Celtics won. And then my mom comes in and says, some guy named Bird scored 60 points. And my dad just looked at me and goes, really? He said, yeah, yeah, dad, you missed a, a pretty big game, 60 points, and, and it's very hard to replicate. So that core of the Celtics has um, always been a team that I cheer for. Now, a team that I didn't cheer for was the Chicago Bulls and some guy named Michael Jordan. Hey, and, Rob. Yeah. I want to, uh, wouldn't it have been great to have been there the night Will Chamberlain scored 100 points? In, in Hershey, Pennsylvania? Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine get back in time and be a part of that game right there? Exactly. So, well, to go, continue on with the basketball, uh, I was a Patrick Ewing fan, and everybody else loved MJ, but Ewing couldn't get past. Uh, the Chicago Bulls and there's this historic dunk of where he goes baseline and dunks over my guy Patrick Ewing and I share that baseline because essentially even though we had the core and even though we established the baseline as, as I mentioned sports management started to splinter off and you started to have some people really go into kinesiology you started to have some people go off into sports studies and yet some people go off into sports management and when you're looking at these sports management programs and sports studies programs, some of them are in the school of business, some of them are in education. So we've established a core, we've established a baseline, but there's still that internal struggle of, of finding the perfect definition of what exactly is sports management and how do we prepare for a career in sports management. Now, when we're talking about jobs, and I think that's what everybody wants to learn more about it, when you talk about jobs in sports management, everybody thinks that they're going to become the next Scott Van Pelt and work for ESPN and live in Bristol, Connecticut, or, or now Scott's doing so well. He works for ESPN, but he's able to live in, in Maryland where he loves his Terrapins and, and he's the uh, late night talk, late night sports center host. A lot of people also think that they're going to become the general manager of the Steelers. Well, I know they didn't finish the way that they hope to finish, but I don't see Mr. Rooney making any changes in the general manager position anytime soon. A lot of people think that they also are going to become the super agent and they're going to become Drew Rosenhaus or they're going to become Scott Boris and just make it rain for their clients and become the next Jerry Maguire. The only problem is when you have students that think like that, you have to remind them that's not necessarily going to happen. It's like this young man who tries to leap and thinks he's going in for the touchdown and that's not gonna happen. Um, a lot of times we have people who say, I wanna work in sports, but when we pull the layers back, we, we really realize they're a sports fan. They're like Drake, they, they, they love sports. They wanna be on the sidelines. They think that they're the best at fantasy football and other fantasy sports, but they don't necessarily understand how sports operates. And so for those people who really try to say, buy a ticket, go tailgate, have a good time. But when we start to look at how sports operates, we got to go a little bit deeper. So we always try to tell folks, if you want to work in sports management, open your eyes behind, be, beyond ESPN and beyond the Pittsburgh Steelers and uh, beyond being a super sports agent. Some of the areas in sports management include working for sports agencies, working for Nike, Adidas, Under Armour in the apparel industry, um, working for campus recreation, you go to Ohio State and, and they have these huge campus recreation facilities for climbing walls and for intramurals and for club sports. Working in college sports, division one level, division two level, division three level, NAIA, junior college. Working events, think about the US Open Golf Championship that's come to Pittsburgh. 
Think about the Pittsburgh or the Dick Sporting Goods Pittsburgh Marathon, working for facilities. You know, if you're working for uh, PPG Arena, you're not just thinking about the Penguins playing there or Duquesne basketball playing there for their big games, but you're also trying to think about NCAA volleyball championships, NCAA wrestling championships, first and second round of basketball. Oh, and we also want to try to get concerts in there, Disney on ice. Um, we also want to try to have some different conventions in there as well. So facilities is another place that a lot of times students overlook. Fitness is a huge place that continues to grow because it used to be your Gold's Gym, it used to be um, um, your, your Curves for women, but now we're starting to see more family fitness, now we're seeing, starting to see CrossFit. So the fitness industry is another area that students um, frequently overlook. The golf industry, high school athletics and youth sports, and then these areas as well. Thinking about working for Big Brothers, Big Sisters, or the Boys and Girls Club, and being involved not just in mentoring, but in fundraising and promoting your organization. Thinking about parks and recreation and youth basketball leagues and um, trips to different sporting events for the people that live in your community. Thinking about professional sports and working in business operations, working in media relations, sponsorships, facility and events, and the many different areas that fall underneath a professional sports umbrella. Thinking about the, the multimedia, the radio, the television, the internet, digital. And then also, also thinking about retail, we're very fortunate that in our backyard and uh, outside of Pittsburgh, we have the corporate offices of Dick's Sporting Goods. But one of the things to, that students need to do and people who want to want to work in sports need to do is they need to figure out what skill sets they need to acquire and strengthen. Writing is, is something that we cannot stress enough of is, is making sure that you have strong writing skills. Being proficient in sales. When you play sports, you're used to rejection. Well, sales is the same way. You got to get used to rejection and have thick skin and get out there and generate revenue for your organizations. Being involved in promotion, being involved in trying to make your organization stand out. In front of us, we have Mr. Curry and the Golden State Warriors. Everybody knows who they are. But what about the developmental basketball leagues in the NBA? How do you promote them? How do you get people to buy tickets to the Youngstown Phantoms? How do you get people to come enjoy the game experience of the Mahoney Valley Scrappers? So trying to promote smaller organizations. Skill sets of details are extremely important because a lot of times we're used to being a sports fan, but we got to think about the details. When you're working in facility and events, you're the first to arrive and you're the last to leave. And somewhere in between there, that's where the players start to roll in. Somewhere in between there, that's where the fans start to roll in. But you got to be on top of the details if that light goes out on the scoreboard. You got to be on top of the details if you're all of a sudden one of your sponsors shows up at the ticket window and didn't notify you that they were coming and you got to find a good place for them to be seated in the arena. So taking care of the details, taking care of numbers. If, if the global pandemic has taught us anything, it's how can we do more with less and really try to modify the programming that we're offering for these fans, knowing that sometimes our revenue streams are gonna go down. So we have to be able to look at the numbers and say, what are our priorities within our spreadsheets? Now, some of the other skill sets that students really need to embrace and those people who wanna work in sports, is cognitive intelligence, emotional intelligence, and social intelligence. And what we mean by cognitive intelligence is, is really knowing the technical areas relative to your field. Say, for example, you wanted to work for a whitewater rafting company with Ohio Pile. What you need to know for that sports organization is gonna differ from what you need to know from working in high school athletics. So being cognitive and being uh, aware of the different specifics that go to every area of the sports industry. The emotional intelligence is, well, you wanna cheer and go crazy, buy that ticket. You wanna have that pregame tailgate and have a beer and a postgame party, buy that ticket. But a lot of us who work in sports management, you, you don't get to watch the game. I remember working at Georgia and working at Virginia Tech. A lot of time I would watch the game on the regional sports network later on that night. Uh, you'd get that at the facility so early and you were the last one to leave, you were exhausted and you didn't get to watch it because you were trying to make sure everybody else was having a great time and everything else was done in the way it needed to be done. So you would hear the roar of the crowd, but it wasn't until later that I'd get on the treadmill to try to unwind that I'd turn on the TV and say, oh, okay, that, yeah, that was a great play. 
So having that emotional intelligence to be able to stay even keel and stay even keel when your team's going through a losing streak, stay even keel when you're the Pittsburgh Pirates. And it wasn't too long ago that they were in the wild card race, but now the perception is we're way too young. We're not spending enough on the payroll. Well, we still need to sell tickets. We still need to bring sponsors in. You got to have that emotional intelligence to, to know we can't necessarily get out there and say, you're right, you're right. We're not spending enough money. Or you can't go out there and tweet, um, hey, this team's being cheap, or we shouldn't have traded this person, or we should have kept Andrew McCutcheon. So you got to have that emotional intelligence. And then you got to have the social intelligence. And what we mean by that is you need to be able to relate to everybody. That's the beauty of sports. Is when you think about sports, you have people of different ages coming in different races, different ethnicities, different political beliefs, different religious beliefs, different socioeconomics. Um, it's just, it's a melting pot. And everybody comes to escape. Everybody comes to, to have a good time with their friends. So you gotta have that social intelligence of being able to relate to everybody and say, you know, hey, how's everything going? What can we get for you? Uh, make sure you come back and see us next time. And, and the same, whether you're talking to somebody who owns a suite or somebody who just bought an all you can eat ticket for the very first time. Being able to know they could spend their money elsewhere. Um, we kind of learned that by the pandemic is that we can watch sports on TV. And when we watch sports on TV, you have these bigger TVs, you can pause it. If the game turns into a route, you can turn it off and you don't have to fight traffic on the way home. Concessions are cheaper in your kitchen. Uh, you have a better choice in your kitchen of what the concessions are. I hope the bathrooms are cleaner where you live so you can go to the bathroom instead of having to wait in line with 100 people. So we have to understand that our social intelligence, we have to be in customer service and customer driven. It's about them first and it's about us last. And then the, the other things you have to understand about working in sports is everybody who likes to work in sports. So you gotta elbow people out. Um, I remember playing basketball against Allen Iverson, and I like to think I was a pretty smart student. So I came in going, uh, I'm going to stop him. And you know how I'm going to stop him? I'm competitive. I'm going I'm to grab onto his jersey. And I'm going to hold it. And when the ref's not looking, I'm just going to keep a tight grip on it. And then when the ref looks, I'm going to let go. And that's going to frustrate him. And, you know, he's going to get frustrated and, and not shoot very well. Well, I didn't look at the scouting report very well. Because if I looked at the scouting report, I would have realized that Allen Iverson was a point guard, and there was a guy named Tony Rutland, who was a shooting guard, and he went on to become the shooting guard at, at Wake Forest alongside a guy named uh, Tim Duncan. And then the other three players out there were about six foot four, 270 pound football players. And their one role was to make sure that these two guards scored 80 points. And if you tried to even touch them, they would elbow you. They would set picks on you that would just knock the wind out of you. They weren't gonna let you grab jerseys or, or try to be physical with the guards. So even though I had that competitive edge, it didn't work against Allen Iverson. But when you work in the sports industry, you're, you're always trying to get that edge to elbow out other people that wanna work in the sports industry. You know, I think that um, there, there are certain fields where people might say, I don't think there's a, a lot of people that wake up in the morning and say, I wanna do this field or do that field. But I think there's a lot of people that would wake up and say, oh, I'd love to be at Heinz Field every single day. I'd love to be at PNC Park. I'd love to be at the Horseshoe up in, in Columbus. So you got to have that competitive edge and, and figure out what's going to make you stand apart from your competition. Now, let's look at some of the hard truths. I got to bring in some of the wrestling, not the wrestling. The wrestling is what they do at Iowa and Penn State, and they win the championships, and they're different weight classes. You got to use the wrestling image with the, you know, you can't see me, John Cena, because that corporation of WWE is, is kind of ridiculous. They're, they're global. Um, they have their own network. So they've done some amazing things in terms of licensing and merchandise. So I, I got to use and, and give a little shout out to the WWE, even though it's scripted sports. Now using that image, the reason why I use that is it's as much who you know and trying to get a job in sports as what you know. It's as much who you know as what you know. So you can have a, a really nice resume and you can have some great experiences, but you, you gotta put yourself out there to meet some different people. So I know that at Westminster, a couple of things that we really do to get our students out there is we force them to do informational interviews. 
And sometimes people don't respond to them. So then we move on to the next person and hopefully they'll respond to them. And we force them to do job shadowings. And by doing these two things, we're trying to move beyond just a piece of paper selling you that resume to doing a job shadowing. And all of a sudden they say, you know what? We really enjoy you. Why don't you come back and intern with us this summer? Why don't you come back and, and let's have an interview with you? You're automatically on the short list. We don't want to look at these other 500 resumes. So it's as much who you know as what you know. And so you have to really engage in networking. You have to put yourself out there and join different organizations within the sports industry. You know, maybe it's a college sports organization like NACTA. Maybe you want to join a coaching association. So there's different organizations that you can join to foster your networking and learn more about the area that interests you. There's also conferences that you can attend as well. So there's people who want to work in sports, but then it hones in to a smaller segment of people who want to work in baseball, or people who want to work in college sports, or people who want to work in, in uh, youth sports. So what conferences can you attend where you can meet other people, learn from them, and then they can pull you into the industry? Because it's a lot easier to sell yourself face-to-face -face than it is on a piece of paper. So when you go to these conferences, I always tell my students, conferences are fantastic, but always try to see if these conferences have a career fair too. Um, there's some conferences that they bring speakers in and, and that's fantastic, but they don't have that career fair component. So when you're looking at conferences, always look to see if there's going to be a career fair component where you can drop resumes off and do some small talk with the people that are ultimately going to look at the resume, because here's how it works. They'll do some small talk with you. And as soon as you walk away, they'll write down on the resume, good stuff, or maybe some bad stuff. You know, this person had a great personality. Uh, this person was dressed to impress. This person talked about the business of sports, or this person just seemed like a fan and didn't really seem to understand what we're all about. So you always try to figure out which conferences have those career fairs. Another hard truth is you want to welcome competition. I, I joke with my students, if you want an easy career, go become a doctor. And I say that because I'm the JV, Dr. Zulo. My, my dad is a medical doctor. He's the one that tells people that they have six months to live. The worst thing I tell people is you have to repeat my class. But at the end of the day, working in the sports industry is extremely competitive, extremely competitive because you have people coming out of colleges, you have people coming out of graduate programs, you have people who are, are changing jobs and changing careers. So it's extremely competitive, but you have to welcome that. You have to know that. You have to be like The Rock and say, okay, go ahead and bring on that competition. And so at Westminster, some of the things that we do to foster some of the competition is we compete in state and regional and national competitions. So some of the competition we've been involved at is getting our students out there and engaged in analytics competitions or engaged in case study competition. So that way they can see, wow, I, I thought I was a, a big fish in a small pond. I can see there's some other really good competition at some of these other schools. And when I tell students, your competition isn't those around you. What I mean is, I think back to the legendary coach, John Wooden, who won so many championships at UCLA. They never prepared for the other team. They always prepared to be the best that they could be. And when they lost a rare game, if they walked off the court and they said, we played the best we could and somebody else was better on us on that particular day, they were okay with that. So I always challenge people who want to work in sports is don't look to your left, don't look to your right. Think about how you can be the best that you can be. Make sure that that resume is as great as it can be. Make sure your GPA is as strong as it can be. The experiences are strong and you've been strategic in how you want to present your case for how you can add value to an organization. Now, the third thing I wanna share a hard truth about working in sports is make the big time where you are. Make the big time where you are. So many people say, I wanna work for the Steelers. I wanna work for the Penguins. I wanna work for Penn State. And the reality is there's so many wonderful jobs out there that people frequently overlook because we get so caught up in the paradigm of ESPN or Sports Illustrated. And we have to understand that there's some great opportunities for people to work in a dive shop down in the Keys. There's some great opportunities for people to work in minor league teams out in Nebraska. There's some great opportunities for people to work for a small radio station here in Mercer. 
I always think about Bob Greenberg and the passion, that, the passion that he shows for sports in this area and particularly high school athletics and bringing his experience, but also bringing the opportunity to broadcast high school games to this area on 96.7. So always try to figure out how to make the big time where you are. It might be some obscure website like Barstool Sports that you create to try to take on ESPN, that you, that you create to try to take on CBS Sports. So always try to figure out how to make the big time where you are. There's a, a book by Jim Collins called Good to Great. He talks about finding your hedgehog. And what he means by finding your hedgehog is try to figure out what you're passionate about. Try to figure out what you're really good at. And then try to figure out how those things can make you money. And if you can do those three things, what you're passionate about, what you can be the best in the world at, and what you can make money from, then you find your hedgehog. And if you do that, you don't work a day in your life. Now, another hard truth I wanna share is don't skate to the puck. Don't skate to the puck. I, I don't know anything about hockey. I'll be the first to tell you that. But Wayne Gretzky once said, I don't skate to where the puck is, I skate to where it's going. And so I always tell the students, you gotta think a couple of steps ahead. Where is sports going? We're not getting smaller, we're only getting bigger. We're becoming more and more global. And with all the technology we have, watching rugby in Australia is not far-fetched. We're also looking more at the numbers and the analytics. And you look at the baseball shift or you look at uh, money ball. Well, everybody's looking for the next money ball. Everybody's looking for the next secret that's going to make their organization successful. So find ways to embrace the use of analytics. Find ways to generate revenue for your organization. If we're having to trim staff sizes because of a global pandemic, we're going to keep the people that generate revenue. We're going to keep, you know, Tom Brady is irreplaceable. LeBron James is irreplaceable. The people that generate huge revenue for our organization, they're irreplaceable. If you can generate revenue through selling the suites, if you can generate revenue through bringing in large corporate sponsors and being told no doesn't phase you, you're going to be someone that's going to be hard to replace. So find ways to develop in areas that are, are only going to get bigger and bigger in the sports industry. You see more of this sports industry becoming digital. So learn more about those fields. And again, don't skate to the puck, skate to where the puck is going. Now in closing, and I wanna give you guys some time to answer some questions. Um, there's a couple of things I just wanted to leave you guys with. And, and one of it is everybody starts somewhere. We, we marvel at LeBron, we marvel at Tiger, we marvel at some of the greats that have played Tom Brady but everybody was a kid. Everybody puts on their pants one leg at a time. Everybody started somewhere. And the same is true with working in sports management. Everybody's got to start somewhere and then continue to move up. Um, even if you're born into a family that owns a professional team, they're not going to hand the keys right over, right away. You got to prove yourself and move up that ladder. The other thing is nobody sits, nobody plays sitting on the sidelines. And what I mean by that is, is you got to be a, willing to jump in and try something that extends your comfort zone. You got to be willing to move. And you can't just stay here and say, I'm going to wait for the Steelers to give me that job. No, sometimes you have to go work for a team out in the middle of uh, nowhere to come home and get that new opportunity. So don't just sit there and wait. You got to go out after these opportunities. You know, if I wanted to work for the Mets when I was growing up and the Mets weren't going to hire me, I couldn't just sit there and twiddle my thumbs that only allowed more competition to come in. I really had to figure out, okay, well, maybe I can work for their minor league team here in Norfolk in my backyard. So always try to figure out where to go to get those opportunities. Don't sit there and wait for them to come your way. And then finally, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. You, you gotta uh, try. You gotta try and you gotta know you're gonna, you're gonna fail. I, I share this with the students all the time. My, my first internship, in sports management was working in facility and events at Virginia my fourth year. And I worked regular season events. I worked ACC events and they hosted some ACC postseasons. I hosted, I, I worked some of the NCAA first round, second rounds of, of soccer, basketball, what have you. And I remember thinking, I'm a big dog. It's gonna be awesome. I'm gonna go work in sports. I'm gonna change the world. 
And so I started applying to the Michigans of the world and the, the Southern cows of the world, and I would get rejection letters. And I started to apply to Miami of Ohio, Western Kentuckys of the world. I'd get these rejection letters. Start to apply to Division Two. I get these rejection letters. I'm thinking, what is wrong? What is going on? And I quickly realized it's that competitive because there are people coming from graduate programs. There are people changing careers that had more revenue generating experience than I did, that had more business analytical skills than I did. So it was that competitive. And I ended up taking that internship at BMI, which was right down the road. And I was still able to be close to family. But I still remember when they called and they said, we want to offer you this internship. And I said, oh, that's great. And they said, yeah, it's a thousand dollars. And I'm thinking, oh, it's a thousand dollars for 10 months. That's sure, $10,000, take, I'll take it. And they said, no, it's a thousand dollars for 10 months. And I'm thinking that that's a hundred dollars a month. That's barely enough for me to get gas in the car to go see my girlfriend. All right, I, I guess I'll take it. And then the rest was history because that was the associate athletic director who pushed me to go to North Carolina and then doors open from there. But if I didn't take that position, somebody else would have. And I wouldn't have ended up on that journey. So you, you have to sometimes be willing to take opportunities that are stepping stones to the next step. And that's what I want to put that little small asterisk. You know, you always hear those pharmaceutical commercials on TV and they mumble real quick about all the side effects that the, this drug may cause for you. I do want to be realistic with anybody that wants to work in the sports industry that you do work nights, you do work weekends, you do work holidays. Think about LeBron James. NBC wants to have LeBron James or ESPN wants to have LeBron James televised on Christmas Day. Well, you're going to be working Christmas Day. And when you first get started, there's very modest pay. You also have to realize that certain fields of sports management pay more than other fields. You know, if you're in the revenue generating side, you're going to make more money. If you're in events and media relations, your salary is not going to be nearly as high as people that are commission based. So those are just some of the realistic expectations I wanted to share with some of the folks that are out there. Um, I would love to take some questions from you guys and I'll leave this slide up there and share some of the resources that we frequently share with our students uh, where jobs are listed. Teamwork Online is a great one. Bluefish.com has a weird name, but it really talks a lot about the recreation jobs that are out there and particularly recreation jobs on a college campus. The NCAA market, if you Google that, that would take you to a, a um, job site for coaching jobs and a lot of the college jobs and business office, ticketing, sponsorships, marketing, events, facilities. Workinsports.com is another one. Uh, Indeed, it is getting stronger and stronger and, and posting more and more jobs out there. And then LinkedIn, you, you got to connect with folks because that's where word of mouth will tell you about well, so-and-so is not posting a job, but here's the information and here's who you need to talk to. Now, as I move into the Q&A part of this, I'd also be happy to um, answer any questions about graduate programs or, or anything you guys want to, to ask. So I'll go ahead and close the screen sharing and I'll open up the floor to any questions. That hey, Rob, Rob, it's Ron Emery. Hey. How are you? Good. So, so great, great presentation. Um, I do want to just uh, <clears throat> a number of the, the folks on the call I know personally, um, but I want to I want to reiterate some of the stuff you you just uh, gave us. And, and number one, when you said I have never worked a day in my life and wouldn't that be a nice um, uh, mantra to have attached to your name after living your life. But, you know, one of the things that, and, and most of the folks on the call are probably going to say that can't happen, but I'm here to tell you it can happen because I really enjoy my life and I enjoy what I do. And, and uh, I've really never worked a day in my life. I've done what I've loved to do. The second thing is don't underestimate the importance of networking, like Rob said. Um, and, and don't underestimate the people that could get you networked that you didn't think could get you networked. Like if somebody came to me and said, hey, 
you know, I want to get involved in this and I want to, you know, there's the look at my network of people and I'm, I'm, you know, good friends with the president of New Balance Canada. Mm -hmm. I'm good friends with the people at Canadian Tire that buy merchandise for Canadian Tire. And somebody would say naturally, hey, Canadian Tire, what the hell's tires have to do with sports? And I, they technically they don't, but Canadian Tire is the largest uh, retailer of hockey equipment in Canada. So don't overlook the simple things. Um, I want to reiterate the the uh, suggestion that you gave about, you know, sometimes you need to volunteer to get experience. And it's it's what we call paying your dues. And it, it happens. And I don't care what you do and what career you follow, but sometimes you got to pay your dues. <clears throat> the other thing is minor league hockey teams. There's a ton of them. I have played racquetball with so many young people from the Phantoms. Now they're coming from Chicago, they're coming from Pittsburgh, they're wherever. Um, if you're local to, to Youngstown, why don't you get connected? And if you need somebody to connect you, let's figure out who that person is. The, the other thing, and I hope, I hope Michael talks about this because he is, um, doing these internet podcasts and and that's a great way they got a little sports show they do on monday night that's a great way of getting out there and getting your name known and getting visibility because that's what's so important the retail piece don't underestimate that as well because there's a huge need for that and it gives you great experience the last thing i'm going to say <clears throat> is um, maybe some of you that, that went to Westminster know A.J. Bove. <laughs> A.J. works for me at Iton Industries in Ashton Beulah. A.J. is now in charge of Ramp Armor, which sales, which is part of our skateboard surfacing. That's his sports career as well. I mean, the, he developed the glove, Odorex Athletics, Cool, cool stuff. If you haven't seen it, look it up on the internet. And Ramp Armor, <clears throat> go to RampArmor.com. But this is surfacing for skateboards that has different textures that is basically sold to skate parks. <clears throat> so I just want to wrap this, wrap up my comments by saying, don't underestimate who can get you connected, because you you say to yourself, and I'm sure. You know, I've, I've done this many times myself. What the hell does that guy know about this? He's not, he's not an athlete. But anyway, you know, it's, it doesn't matter. It's being out there and networking and connecting the dots. And if you can do that, you'd be surprised at what you find. So that's, that's it, Rob. Well, and the other thing is, for some folks, it might be your side hustle. Um, I know for me, it's, I, I love teaching. I love being in the classroom, but I wanted to write that textbook because I felt there was a shortage of textbooks on college sports. There was a lot of reform in college sports, but there wasn't a, here's how to work in college sports and the day-to-day -day stuff you need to know. Well, every penny that's come from that textbook, every royalty has gone into my son. He's four years old, his college funds. That's a, yeah. I guess a side hustle. So some of you may say, okay, this woman do Monday through Friday, eight to five, but then on weekends, I, I love to umpire, or I love to officiate, or I love to go work on press row at, uh, at YSU basketball games, helping out with the scorekeeping. And I get to sit courtside in front of some great sports and still get to be involved in that aspect. So it doesn't have to be your primary thing. It could be something you enjoy on the side too. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if Michael, I don't know if you want to talk, but Michael, it would be great to hear your story because I think it's pretty interesting of what you've done with uh, with your podcast and what you're doing because it, it 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 speaks to exactly what we're talking about. So, Michael, do you want to talk a little bit? You're on mute, just so you know. So, go ahead. Yeah. So, just with our podcast, it's just something me and my one friend I have in one of my classes and one of his other friends. We just 
wanted to get together and just talk about sports and just kind of get ourselves out there. We put our shows on YouTube so anybody can go watch them. Um, but that's, we just kind of want to do something, just talk about sports and cause that's all what our field is. And we want to work in the sports field. And that's just something we thought we could get out there for people to listen to. I mean, to me, that's a visibility that you need to have a great resume builder to say you've done this. What do you say, Rob? I think that's great. And I think it also goes back to the revenue because you're talking about something you love. <laughs> But you get a couple of local sp sponsors in and you drop them in every now and then or you, you drop them in at the very beginning and the show brought to you by it, it's some extra money in your pocket too yeah and it's kind of like being a small business you're always trying to be agile and quick and innovative and, and talk about things you know ES espn is huge but sometimes it takes a while for them to make some decisions because they got shareholders and board of directors and stuff so yeah, things like youtube and podcasts that, that's the aspect that changes so quickly yeah <laughs> What kind of questions can I answer for you guys? I mean, you're giving up your time on a on a Wednesday night. So what, what kind of questions can I answer for folks? And Ron, I'll start calling on them too if they don't ask any questions. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> Go ahead. So uh, I was just wondering how important the um, uh, adding a you know a master's degree is to to doing this. Is experience more important, or do you need both of them, or? Well, here's the thing with the master's degree. Um, I always encourage students to get the MBA because I go back to that statement I said about long nights, weekends, and holidays. I think if you have the MBA, you're uh, multidimensional. You can go in different directions if you want to. If, if sports is something that maybe wears you out a little bit. But it, it really just goes back to what the student is about. I, I've had students that from day one of their freshman year in college, they were jumping in and, and doing stuff like Michael was talking about, creating their own podcast, you know, trying to figure out, okay, maybe we're a small division three school like Westminster, but how could I sell sponsorships at games? How could I start a, a, a student support group? So their experience over four years is through the roof. Other people, maybe they were playing sports and maybe they were working a job to pay the bills and that graduate school might give them a little bit more experience being a graduate assistant working in an athletic department. So there's no one size fits all. Everybody's a little bit different, but at the end of the day, you, you got to find people that are going to know other people that can introduce you and make the referrals. Uh, you know, Chris would be great for your organization. We don't have a role for him here. He's done everything he can do for us here, but yeah, let's make a call on his behalf to see if we can get him in there. So I wish I had a, a one size fits all magic potion, but it, it really depends on each student. It can't be on Chris, the same time. Chris, one, uh, one other thing, Chris. There's, uh, keep in mind, I'll go ahead. Is, am I talking over somebody? Okay, keep in mind that these, these young people I, I played with that sold Phantom tickets and sold, um, you know, we're in the Phantom's marketing area. Um, his next job, he left Youngstown and his next job was with the Philadelphia 76ers to go into their marketing department. That's a good career jump. Okay. So. Think, yeah, think about it this way. If you can sell hockey where you don't know a single player on the team and notice no one else does either. You know, you're not selling Crosby. You're not selling uh, the Capitals and their Stanley Cup title. You're selling these young folks in the, in the Mahoney Valley Scrappers. You're selling the young folks for the Phantoms. You're selling the experience. Come down and have cheap beer. Come down with one of your friends and just enjoy this night. You can sell that. Then when you get to the next level, oh, it's, it's easy to sell Super Bowl titles and it's easy to sell um, the best players on the court, your Ben Simmons of the world, and that, that gets easy. But so selling the, the tough stuff, if you can make it, if you can cut your teeth there and get through that grind, that's the good stuff. That's, that's what you can walk on on a sport team. You know, make it on that team, then you've made it. I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. And anybody on here, you know, Chris, your, yourself, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, and I'd be happy to talk further one on one. Um, about any graduate programs you're curious about or give you feedback. Because I will say it's, it's one of those fields where sometimes you have some schools where they want to use sports management as a um, enrollment tool. Uh, so there are some graduate programs out there that are online. And I'll, I'll use Liberty 
university, for example, they might have 5,000 people in their graduate program online. You're just a number. So you want to think about where can I be that I can really gain some experience and do some networking and not just be a number. Thank you. Um, so we had we had somebody on that I was talking over. That's okay. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know who that was, but you're more than welcome to talk. So Michael, how old are you? What are you working on right now? Are you in college or what? Yes, yeah, so I'm in my third year of college at YSU. And what do you want to do long term? Um, well, my major is journalism, okay. and I wanted to work in sports media long term. Okay. So I look over at that uh, NBC affiliate and the young guy who does the sports, I, I don't think he's much older than you. you know, that's that type of thing where I'd reach out and say, hey, can I do a job shadowing and pick your brain, which could possibly lead to your name being on a short list for um, internships and those types of opportunities. So you know, if, let everybody else look at Pittsburgh and DC and the New York market. Right here in, in Youngstown, my gosh, we have so many great resources that are, yeah. are phenomenal. So. Well, you know, Michael, one thing to remember is Derek Steyer, who does the news on 21, mm -hmm. is a good friend of mine and plays racquetball with me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it'd be very easy, very easy to play racquetball and have lunch or, you know, uh, breakfast on some Saturday or Sunday morning and you get to meet him, you can network with him. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Well, for folks that want to work in the sports industry, never hesitate to offer, <clears throat> I will bring you coffee. I will buy your lunch because that's the type of thing where they're going, all right, you know, I only got 30 minutes to eat, but okay. Now, more than likely, they won't make you pay. But that 30 minutes, that, that could be the, the thing that separates you apart. Uh, there's a book called Ice to Eskimos, How to Sell a Product That Nobody Really Wants. And it talks about the Memphis Grizzlies and when they weren't very good in basketball and they mailed out um, rubber chickens to all their season ticket holders that had not renewed tickets. And it was just something completely different, something out of the ordinary that people were like, oh yeah, I need to re re reorder these tickets before I lose them. So sometimes you have to do things out of the ordinary to say, yes, can I pick your brain and spend 20 minutes with you at Starbucks and learn more about it? And that's how relationships start. That's how the networking happens. When you're looking at 500 resumes, it all runs together. But when you have that face-to-face -face time, that's how you really sell yourself. I, April was on this call. Every time I see April on, on campus, always happy, always a, a, a bounce in her step. And then I started to learn more about her. And it's like, okay, she's married. She has a couple kids. Everybody else is tired, wearing sweats, and she's always on cloud nine. That's I know. April's, April's aggressive. Yeah, that, and that, but that's what people look for. They want well, that. <laughs> Now watch, tomorrow she'll be in sweats, no makeup. <laughs> so, Well, guys, any of you that want to reach out anytime, um, whether it's tonight, tomorrow, 10 years from now, just say that I was here talking to you guys, and I'll be happy to help out any way I can. It's, it's a wonderful field to work in. You never work a day in your life, um, but I'll be happy to kind of just give you some honest advice. Of if, if you're money-driven, you got to be in sales. If you want to be close to the action, uh, facility and events is good. Uh, just these are the little details that we can, we can pull the curtain back and show how the sausage is made, if you will. Well, Rob, thank you very much for the uh, inspiring talk tonight. Very good. Thanks for having me, and, and, and thanks for all of you guys coming in, and I'll see you guys soon. All right. Thank take you. care. Thank you. Thank you.